Chapter 10 of the Functional Programming Tutorial. The focus of this chapter is on three type constructions. To begin, let us consider the interpreter pattern. This is a design pattern where you represent your program as a data structure and you program an interpreter to run the, your data structure. So, as an example, consider this uh, domain-specific language for complex numbers. It's a very simple language. It has three operations. To create a complex number out of a string, to multiply complex numbers, and to compute the complex conjugate number. If I want to represent uh, this computation as data, in other words, not to run it yet, but to write down the operations as data, then I could imagine implementing it like this. I can implement some case classes in a disjunction, uh, like this. So I have a program type. It has three parts of the disjunction, which is either a string, which will represent this operation, parsing a string into a complex number, multiplication of two complex numbers, and computing the complex conjugate number. And then I can imagine that instead of this program, I will have a data structure with nested case classes like this. In order to be able to define such a data structure, my case classes should have these types. So for instance, the multiplication case class will contain two parts, and each can be itself another program. So that's why the types of the parts of these case classes are again the type program itself. So in this way, having defined these type, uh, parts of the case class as programs, I enable myself to write down arbitrary nested case classes. So this has type program. I can use this as part of another case class, like mu or uh, conjugate. So in this way, I have created a domain-specific language that expresses computations with complex numbers as data structures. In order to actually compute anything with any complex numbers, I would need to run this program, this DSL program, as I would say. Um, the interpreter will be a function of type, type signature maybe like this, it will take an argument of type program and it will return a pair of double numbers which would represent the complex number that is the result of computing this program. So uh, why would you use the interpreter pattern? Um, because it has certain benefits in certain cases. One main, main benefit is that you represent a certain domain-specific language, that is, a number of operations that are specific to a certain task or a domain, such as complex number computations. Uh, you encapsulate all these operations in a data type that fully describes what needs to be done without actually doing it. So you represent as data what uh, otherwise you would write as executable code. Data is much more easily composable. It can be manipulated, transformed before running it. So before you run your DSL program, you can store it in some data structure, you can put it on disk in a file, read it back, send it over the internet, and compose it with other DSL programs in the larger DSL program 
all that is data manipulation that has nothing uh, running yet, nothing is computed yet. When you're ready, you call the run function and actually compute the results. So um, this very simple DSL, domain specific language, has uh, spe shortcomings specifically it works only with simple expressions um, it represents expressions as unevaluated expression trees so um, every operation needs to be some vertex of a tree uh, but that's that's okay but we don't have enough uh, different operations defined so that for instance we cannot express variable binding and conditions um, here for instance we can imagine that this a uh, could be used somehow in these operations but I cannot express it here all I can express is multiplying two complex numbers converting strings to complex numbers and computing a complex conjugate number. There is no way to express that I have a variable in my language, in the DSL, not a Scala variable. Scala variables I can of, of course have, I can say val x equals this, but that is not at the level of the domain specific language. The language itself doesn't know as f so far anything about defining variables and because of this I cannot use any code that is not expressed in this DSL so for example I could imagine calling a numerical algorithms library to compute some special function of the complex number and that could be a complicated algorithm but I cannot put it into the DSL I would have to express the entire algorithm using DSL operations if I wanted to do that. So let's uh, try to overcome these shortcomings. These are certainly not due to interpreter pattern itself. It's just that our DSL is too simple. So let's see how we can do variable binding in a DSL like this. Now let's uh, consider another example for this, uh, which is a DSL for reading and uh, uh, writing files. Let's, let's just look at reading files for now. So the DSL will have um, two operations. First, so this on the left is a non-DSL program. It's a program that we write in Scala. We want to replace this with a DSL program, with a um, data structure. So the functionality we want to implement is to create a path for a given file name. So this could um, check that it exists or whatever. Translate this into some URL if necessary. We don't know. So right now we just say there is some operation that creates paths out of strings. And there is another operation that reads a file at a given path and the result is a string. So you read the contents of a file. So then suppose we have this logic. We read one file and if its contents is not empty, then we interpret its contents as another file name and we read that. And then we want to return the string that uh, is in the second file. And if it's an empty file, then we return an error string like this. So how can we implement this logic in the DSL? Well, we need to bind a variable, such as here str, to a value that is computed by the DSL at runtime. And we need to evaluate some condition or generally we need to use the value of this variable 
while constructing further DSL expressions. So to understand how we can implement this, consider that in the DSL everything must be some kind of expression tree and um, this part of the program needs to be also represented by an expression tree and this expression tree is actually a function of the variable str so the variable str will be assigned when we run this DSL program and actually read the files but before we do that the DSL already needs to specify that this entire rest of the program is a function of this variable. So in order to represent that uh, we need a special construction in the expression tree and I call this construction bind which is just the name of a case class and this case class will have uh, an argument which is a function actually a Scala function from a Scala variable str to another tree and so um, this is how I implement this domain specific language again we I have a sealed trait program or prog which now has four case classes and the three case classes here are the ones that I would need to implement functionality so for example I need literal strings so I represent that with this literal case class I need paths whose contents are maybe programs again because uh, I don't know path can be computed and I need to read again I need to read something which could be another DSL program so that's what I do in these three case classes and I also add a case class bind which represents uh, binding a non-DSL variable to a value which is uh, computed when you run the DSL and then uh, so I have the first part of this case class is a DSL program which when run will give me a value of type string and the second part of the case class is a function from string to another DSL program so this function is a Scala function is not a DSL function is a Scala function which is uh, now part of my data structure in this way I can inject arbitrary Scala code in principle in the code of this function including conditions or creating another DSL program by using the values of these variables in an arbitrary way so this variable uh, will be the argument of f so here is an example uh, I make a bind so this entire thing becomes a bind of this which is read path literal file and this which is a Scala function that executes my conditional computation and then returns a value of type program again so it returns a DSL program so this is a function that takes a string and returns a program so that is how I can easily implement the requirement that the DSL should express variable binding, conditional computations, arbitrary Scala code in those computations and um, using the Scala variables which is this one in creating expression trees. So I still have an expression tree, this entire thing is still expression tree and still unevaluated but now I have a lot more flexibility in what sort of computations I can implement uh, with the DSL. Uh, the interpreter for the DSL will still have the same type signature. It will be uh, perhaps slightly more complicated. So let's look at 
uh, code examples. So first, uh, the DSL for complex numbers, which is what we saw before. So the only um, interesting code here is in running a DSL program. And here's how we run. Um, we basically take the value of the program, which is going to be one of these three case classes, and we match on it. In each case, we run what's inside. So in this string case, the inside is a definition of a complex number by string, such as this one. We need to parse it, so I have some regular expression that I parse this with, and the result is going to be uh, one value, then a sign, and then another value. And then I create a complex number out of that. The multiplication is a standard formula for complex multiplication, but notice that both of these are programs. So the mul case class contains two programs that first have to be run in order to get the complex numbers out of them, and then I execute the complex multiplication. Similarly, the conjugate operation, first I have to run the uh, program that is the argument here, and then I execute the operation. So here is a test. Uh, conjugate of multiply of this, which is equal to this complex number. So in order to get it, I do run of program. So when I do this, nothing is run yet. It's a data structure. And I could have a code that, for example, simplifies this in some way, maybe, um, or prints it, or whatever. It's a data structure that is available for me to work with. I could um, typeset this in LaTeX if I wanted to before running it. So then I, I also can run it. So this is the power of the interpreter pattern. Let's look at uh, implementing the DSL for file operations that I uh, described. In order to run this, I will have a mock file system, um, which will be just um, a map from string to string so that the file name is mapped to the text inside the file. So that this is just so that my tests are easier. I don't need to write a lot of code um, actually reading and writing files. Um, so I declare my prog type as a disjunction like this, like shown in the slide. And now I need to define the run. Now run is um, similar to what we had in the complex number case in that, for example, I need to always run the arguments first and then I do something with them. So for simplicity, path will just evaluate to a string and read will uh, look up the file contents in the, in the, in the dictionary. So note, we cannot guarantee that P is a path here. P is just a program. It could, it, it is evaluated to a string, but so maybe it's a path, maybe, maybe not. We have to be careful when write, write, writing these programs. The runner cannot check that the program makes sense. And finally, let's look at how we implement the bind. So the bind is actually easy to implement. So p is a type program. We need to run it to get a string out of it. f has a type string to program. So we run the p, then we apply f to that result, which is a string. So then f of string is another program, which we again run. So that's how bind works. And that's the entire implementation of variable binding for our programming language for the DSL, domain-specific language. Here is an example program. 
um, this is what is shown in the slide and we can run it and see that it is equal to text. It is equal to text because first we read the file one which gives us this string and we read the file at this path which gives us this string. So that's the text. Now notice that this DSL is not type safe. It allows us to, re to write nonsensical programs like this when you read, 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 and that is nonsensical because you can only read a path and the result of a read is not a path, it's a string, and the program doesn't know about it and just it gives us an exception key not found text uh, which is a kind of a runtime exception uh, since we don't have a file named text in our file system but this should not be the error the error should be uh, you cannot read a literal string you must read a path on the file system which would have been a type error if this were a type safe language. So that's um, uh, the next concern. Our DSL so far has no type safety. Every value in it is a program and it's evaluated to a string. So what can we do if we wanted to avoid errors? Uh, such that for example read of read shouldn't even compile. Uh, it should be impossible to write programs like this and compile them and run them. So the way to solve this uh, problem is to change the type of the program data type to a type constructor. So let us denote by this program of A a DSL program that when run will return a value of type A. Now, in our case right now, it's going to be string. But let's make sure it's string and not some other type, such as a file path. So here's how we do it. Um, we define a disjunction type parametrized by type A, type parameter A. And everything else remains the same, except now we explicitly say that, for example, the argument of bind is a program that has a string result and the function will take that result and output another program with string result. Whereas previously, bind had a program and this function returned a program. Now we explicitly demand that the result must be of type string and then we can apply f to that result. So literal uh, will also give us a, a program returning a string. And path will take a program that returns a string, but it will yield a program that has the path, an I.O. file path type. In other words, it's not a program returning string. And the read will take that kind of program and return a program that evaluates to a string. So in this way, um, we can achieve type safety. So the program remains mostly the same except for the type. Um, the interpreter remains mostly the same, except now it has type safety. Let's see how that works now. Um, so let's implement, uh, instead of NIO, uh, Java file types, let's just have a mock type that represents a file path. So now, uh, how do we implement running? Well, it's the same, except now it's impossible to have path in a program of type string. So, pro program of type string can only be bind, literal, or read. It cannot be a path, because that's a program of type PRG of F path. So we don't need this case here. And instead we just implement directly 
this case where we have a read of a path because there's nothing else we can have. So now the code is type safe. It still works, the same code works. But a program like this doesn't compile. This is a compile time error now. So we will not be able to even create uh, data structures that represent incorrect expressions. That's the advantage of making the DSL file safe, uh, type safe. So here is our DSL so far. Um, there is a pro problem with it, which is um, it basically only binds variables of type string. It cannot bind variables of other types, or it cannot also return variables of other uh, values of other types, because our runner um, returns string and requires a program of string. So still the string type is very special and limiting us. So for example, we cannot do this. Uh, we must have a program that uh, returns a path so we cannot directly read the path and if we wanted to compute this path using a Scala program then we cannot convert this into a program of path because there's no way to do that literal can only take a string and extends program of string so let's fix these problems now so first of all, let's make literal a fully parameterized operation so that it's a literal of A and it returns program of A for any A. And secondly, let's um, replace this string by a parameter A as well. So that would be a parameter A, then it will be an A to program of B. So we want to now have arbitrary types instead of string here. So we introduce two type parameters in bind. And we will have this uh, generality. Everything else stays the same. And except we get rid of these program of string and program of path. Because now we have a literal. And a literal can always convert a string into a program of string and the path into a program of path with uh, no problem. So we don't need to have programs as types here. If we need this kind of thing, we just uh, bind a variable and uh, we'll get, uh, get what we need. So now this is an interesting type because the signatures of bind and literal are very similar to signatures of flat map and pure if you look at this carefully so literal is of type a to program of a and bind is of this type program of a a to program of b and it returns program of b so if we Imagine that this is a function from here to here, then this is going to be just type signature of flat map. And actually, it is in some sense a function. Bind.apply is a function that takes these as arguments and returns a value of this type. Except it's not just any function, it's a type constructor, so this function is defined in a special way. So essentially, this type has methods of type signature flat map and pure. It looks like this type is a monad. So let's actually define these methods flat map, map, and pure. And it's very easy to do that. Flat map uh, will just create a data structure with the case class bind map will be defined uh, automatically via flat map and pure because we know that in the monad we can define map through flat map and pure. A pure 
is defined as just a literal case class. So these methods don't actually compute anything. They don't run the DSL. They create further unevaluated data structures. In other words, these methods create DSL programs out of previously defined DSL programs. These are combinators, in a sense. One usually says they are combinators. They are, are functions that take values of some type and or several of those and create new values of the same type. The advantage of com uh, actually defining flat map, map, and pure is that we can write DSL programs as functor blocks and we can compose them very easily. So for example, if you look at the previous program, we have a bit of a repetition here. We have this read path literal, which we're using twice. So how can we reuse that? Well, very easily. We make a function that returns um, a string valued program like this. So we take a path, we read that file's contents. And this is a standard Scala syntax for the functor block, as I call it, or for yield block. Um, and we can use this syntax now because we have defined flat map and map in the uh, program trait. And now we can easily combine uh, and reuse the monadic values in a, another functor block. So we can write this code uh, as functor blocks as we would do with any other monad. So let's see what the interpreter looks like for this monadic DSL. Now I have full parameterization of types. I um, define pure and map and flat map as before, as, as shown in the slide. Now there is a bit of ugliness in the runner because of the problems with type um, pattern matching. Scala has this problem where you want to pattern match a case class that has type parameters. It's not easy to do that. So I have to do a bit of dancing around. First I match the bind and then I match the result. I cannot put type parameters here. That won't compile. Um, I think. Maybe it will. But I wasn't able to, to do it right. Let me see if I can do it in one go actually. Um, Let's see if this will compile and run. Thank you. A good simplification. Maybe my IDE is not writing my code. Let me just do in this section. Um, the literal and other things are the same, except now I have to do type casting. So again, Scala is not great when you have to do um, type parameters on a case class and you do a match uh, expression. So that's a bit of ugliness, but that's not so bad, um, perhaps. So let's see that all of this actually works. And um, so now we are pretty happy. We have a monadic DSL. Now it's perhaps a little uh, too cumbersome because you need to define all these things every time. So if I wanted to define a DSL for complex numbers in the same way as this DSL, then I would have to add the bind and the literal and these definitions um, every time. So I, I would have to repeat this code every time. 
note that there are no code changes between this DSL for the file operations and this DSL for complex numbers up to here. So this is completely the same. The custom code starts later when we define some more case classes. So let's refactor this DSL so that the common code is separated and the custom code is just wrapped uh, in, the, in some type constructor called F. So here's how we do that. Um, we say there's a DSL type constructor that is parameterized by the type A, just like this one, and a type constructor F that will encapsulate all this custom code. So the type constructor F will have a definition like this, just like our first uh, first try at um, a DSL. So this could be, once we add the type parameter, this could be the type constructor F. And um, then we define just the type class, the, the case classes that are necessary to implement the uh, monad functionality, the bind and literal case classes. And then uh, we have this case class ops for operations, which contain a value of type f of a. And so this is a wrapper over whatever custom operations we have in our DSL. Um, and notice here, the DSL does not have program as parameters here. It has the complex as parameters. It's up to us. We could have program as parameters. It's a matter of convenience. What is more convenient? Um, but whatever that is, it's going to be encapsulated now in the case class ops. So this entire code is going to be generic in the operations of your DSL. So the type constructor F represents the operations of the DSL. And uh, our, the, our uh, type constructor DSL is a, a monadic DSL that is parameterized by that type constructor F. So this code is now generic in the operations of your domain. Now the cost of this is that the interpreter now needs to know how to interpret your operations. So you have to write extra code as opposed to hard coding this. You just uh, write extra code that converts your operations to values. So you evaluate your operations. So for example, this operation uh, would be the domain specific part inside this F type constructor. It needs to be evaluated to yield this path value. So let's see how that works. So um, the DSL will be general. So all this part of code is generic. It does not depend on the domain. All the domain specific operations are encapsulated by the type constructor F, which is defined later in a different place of your code. So in this way, we parameterize by this type constructor and this code is fully generic in any domain. So now, uh, we need to have the extractor, the value extractor or uh, evaluator for your domain. So this um, needs to be a function, as I showed, of this type. 
I would like to uh, emphasize that this type is actually um, parametrized by a type parameter A inside uh, the expression. It is not this, this per all A uh, quantifier needs to be inside here. It cannot be over there. And the reason is that um, when we run the DSL, it takes a program that evaluates a value of type A, but intermediate steps could have different types. It could be that in order to compute a value of type A, you first need to compute some value of type B or C and so on. And when you run those programs, you need to extract a value of type B from some domain-specific operation or type C. So you actually need to have a function in the extractor that is parametrized by an arbitrary other type. It's not going to be of the same type A as the runner. And that's why we cannot use in Scala just a type parameter. You need to have an extra trait that encapsulates inside that another type parameter. So the extractor is not parametrized by A here. It's parametrized just by F and its function apply or extract or whatever you want to call it. It just has a single method and this method is parametrized itself by the type A. So in this way, if the runner has a parameter which is the extractor, the runner is able to call the function extract on arbitrary types here, not necessarily the same type as this one. So this I could rename for clarity. Um, that's uh, necessary for the correct operation. So that's why this parameter of the runner is not parametrized by A, it's only parametrized by F. And inside that, param that, that value, there is a function that works for every X, for every type X. So that is a little clunky in Scala. Scala does not have, right now, a good syntax that expresses uh, such a function. But, um, the cats library has uh, uh, a case class that essentially does this so you can use that. It's called the natural transformation. However, so in the cats library, this will be like that. It's a natural transformation. Um, which has uh, code something like that. Now, in this case, f does not have to be a functor. You see, if you look at our code for our domain-specific language, this uh, program is not a functor because we have specific types here. Um, now, we do have a map function, but only on the entire DSL. The f will only encapsulate these two case classes because we're now separating the custom code from the generic uh, monadic wrapper, the bind and literal, and uh, the f type constructor will only encapsulate the domain specific code which has specific types here and does not have a map method, so it cannot be a functor. It's a partial type to type function that's only defined for specific type parameters, and that cannot be a functor. And so it's not really a natural transformation in the usual sense, because natural transformations are defined between functors, um, but it's very similar. It's kind of a generic or maybe more general case of a natural transformation, which we don't need a name for. It's basically this generic um, mapping from f of x to g of x for any given x. So that's the Scala code that expresses this. 
And this now needs to be the argument of run. So the first argument of run is this extractor, and the second argument of run is this DSL program. So how do we implement run? Very similarly to what we had before, except now we have this extra argument, extract. If you compare this with the previous runner code, it's the same code, except we have run of extract here every time. Run extract, run extract. And the ops case is slightly different, very similar to those other things, but here we already take care of any custom operations because the extract function knows how to evaluate them. So extract of f is the apply method, which will give you an x out of f of x, whatever x might might be. And so this ops doesn't know what type it is, doesn't it's parameterized by the type, and that's fine. So the result of this extract is um, um, is an f of a. Uh, so some kind of f of a for unknown type, really. Not this necessarily the same as this a. So let's see now how we use this. Uh, so we now define a type constructor just for the custom file operations. So this is going to be the f here. So we call it file ops. And now this is just the domain specific operations. There are no uh, bind case classes or literal case classes. We don't need those. Those are going to be provided generically. Extractor needs to be defined only for these. So this is the domain specific code, how to read files, how to create file paths or verify them or whatever uh, this needs to be. So this is going to be actual domain specific code. And then how do we write programs? The same way, we just need to wrap our domain specific operations in ops case class, that's all. We could define helper functions to have less boilerplate in this code, but that doesn't really matter right now. What matters is that we are able to simply write monadic code uh, with very little boilerplate. So imagine that all this up here with the runner, it's completely generic, it's in the library. Our code is just this. It's only the domain specific operations and then we just use the DSL type constructor from the library and we're done. We use the ops uh, from the library. So cat's library provides this, it's called free monad. And it works. Um, let's see how we can use now this, this interesting DSL. Now we, we don't just want to rewrite um, code in a fancy way. We want to have value out of this generality. So one example of how we extract a uh, great value from this code is that now we can easily handle errors. Um, so previously we evaluated a DSL of FA to A. Now we can evaluate it to either of error and A. All we need to do is to provide a different extractor. An extractor would be of this type. So instead of going FA to A, it goes to FA to some error type plus A. And the code of the interpreter is almost unchanged, except, so this is the same, except the pure needs to put uh, the or the literal case class, it's a pure function in the monad, it needs to put this into the right or the either. And the bind needs to use the flat map on the either. Other than that, it's exactly the same. So um, how does this code work? Well, it goes through the expression tree. When it finds the bind um, expression, 
uh, it will now uh, use the flat map of the ether. Well, no, it will first run the same, it's the same run function, it's recursive, it will run on the P, so we have a bind of P and F, run the P that gives you an ether, then you use the flat map on that ether with a function that uh, runs on the result and then applies the run to the result. So the run is a, is a curried function so that I can write this more easily. F and then run. So the flat map here is from the ether monad and this is the pure function of the ether monad. So it's very interesting to see that the code of runner only uses flat map and pure from the ether monad. It's not otherwise aware of the fact that we are running uh, to evaluate things into the ether monad. Uh, and that's very good because it means we can very easily generalize to any other monad except instead of this one. So let's look at the code for the either monad. Um, the way to do that, so you see the program remains the same. We do not change the program at all. We just evaluate it into a different monad, into the either monad, instead of evaluating it to just the value a, which is actually the identity monad. So previously we evaluated the code into the identity monad. Now we're going to evaluate it into the either monad. So all we need to do when define a new extractor, which I called ex, just for brevity, a new runner, uh, which is aware of an arbitrary, well, it's aware of the either monad, actually not arbitrary monad yet. And I just uh, rewrite things a little bit so that I compile this code in Scala and I find that these type parameters are required. But that's all right. So the code works in the same way as in the slides. And it applies this function f, which is of type uh, that it doesn't know. It's not really of type any. It's of type type parameter that I have here, uh, but he doesn't know that. Um, so this function f computes a DSL program, which I then run. So I apply the runner to that program. So that's exactly the same code as I had before, except I'm inserting a flat map from the either monad. And here's the implementation of the extractor. So I need a new extractor which will run domain specific code and catch exceptions. So I would very easily do it like this. Now I have an extractor that takes my file operations and from file operations of A gives me an either of throwable and A. So that's all I need to run my program. Now you see I'm running exactly the same program as before. I did not have to change that code, the domain-specific language that I wrote here, in order to add error uh, extraction, error handling. That is a great power. So I can just replace the extractor here, and I run exactly the same program. So this program could be computed by one part of the code, and the extractor could be prepared by another part of the code completely independently. And here I have shown how we can interpret the program with the result being an either. So I call this to interpret the DSL into a monad. Uh, and so here we interpreted this DSL into the either monad. We can just as easily interpret it into any other monad uh, by adding the monad here as a type parameter and getting rid of either here. And that's it. The, the changes would be minimal because we're not actually using the specifics of either. Here we'll have to replace this by pure. 
that's all. Um, so let us see what the resulting construction actually is. Um, we start with an operations type constructor denoted by f such as um, this one file ops so this is a type constructor that needs to have a type parameter and it needs to encapsulate your domain specific operations in a very special way namely it takes the arguments of the operations as uh, parts of the case class and the return type of the operation becomes the type parameter of this type constructor. So that's the encoding. This is because I remind you that this um, means a program that when run will compute a value of type A. So this is a program that when run will compute a value of type path. Uh, and that's how we encode uh, domain-specific operations. So this operation could be a, a function from string to file path. And this is a function from file path to string. So that's what we need to encode first. And often this type constructor will be not a functor. Maybe it will be um, a partial type-to-type -type function, not a uh, a functor that needs to be a total type to type function always. Um, then we use this uh, DSL, which is a library construction that is written once for all f. The interpreter again is written once for all f, and then we run uh, that program. Once we prepare a program value, actually which we can do using a functor block um, or in any other way. We can do it directly using um, helper functions, for instance. We, we do ops of something and so on. Flat map, we can just write by hand. Map, flat map, and so on. So in this way, we can prepare a value of this type uh, by combining value. So this is very composable. It's pure value. It doesn't yet run anything. It can be stored in variables, in arrays, whatever you want. Then you prepare an extractor value that will um, run just your operations, your, your custom operations, and represents their values in some monad. So this monad can be identity monad if you already want just the final results. It could be an error-gathering monad, it could be some other monad, uh, for instance. It could be a state monad if you want to represent your operations purely as a state updates or something like this. It can be a combination of monads. It can be anything that is a monad. Um, it could be another DSL with a different F. It could be anything. Uh, so once you have this extractor, you run the program like this, and this computes a value of that monad, which could be just A, or it could be an error, something, or, and so on. Um, so to summarize so far, we begin with a number of operations, and uh, these operations could have these types. We define a type constructor then like this. Typically, well, this could be more uh, arguments and I'll have more parts in the case class. If I have no arguments, then I would have a case class with zero arguments, but I need to have a type here. So usually a domain specific language would have functions like this with some return types. So you just put them into your type constructor like this. And then you uh, do what I just described. Now, um, there are some other things you can do, which I will not discuss 
in a lot of detail in this chapter. Um, for instance, you can choose a different monad and then uh, you can interpret um, this value that you have into another monad. Um, so this transformation you can define separately and if this itself is a different DSL uh, created in the same way, then this would be the runner for that DSL that evaluates it into yet another monad n. So this could be very useful um, if you want to, say, test your, your program. So you, you have exactly the same program and you run a test interpreter into some monad that catches all the calls to something and prints uh, diagnostics or whatever. Or you could de design a different uh, monadic DSL that is more optimal, let's say more low level, and then you can have a sophisticated optimizer that translates one DSL into another, and the second DSL will be run later uh, in a yet another runner. You can use monad transformers, since this is a monad um, API. And you can combine DSLs very easily using disjunction. So you have several functors or type constructors, not necessarily functors. You can define a disjunction functor and the DSL of that contains all the operations from each of these functors in a single DSL. So in this way you can define separately several DSLs using uh, these different Fs. You could have F, G, H and so on. And then you put all of them at once into a monadic wrapper. So this, what I call DSL of something, is really a monadic wrapper over type constructors. So these are all the benefits that you get by modeling uh, operations monadically. So let's see um, whether this DSL program, this mon uh, which I, I keep calling it monadic DSL, is it really a monad? Does it satisfy monad laws? It turns out that no, it does not satisfy monad laws, but it actually does satisfy them once you evaluate the program, once you interpret it. So after you run the program, that's when the monad laws are satisfied. And that is a very interesting property. Let's see why that is so. So consider one monad law. This, this is one of the identity laws. So flat map applied to pure must be identity. Let's see if this is so. Now, both sides of this law are functions on the monad. So our monad is this, so it's a function from this to this. So we need to apply both sides to some arbitrary program of this type. And we need to get the new value and see if that value is the same, because that should be identity. So let's see. So what happens if we take a program and we execute dot flat map of pure on it. Now flat map according to our definition, it just makes a bind uh, data structure. Since nothing is really evaluated, we just put more case classes on the data structure. So that, that is going to be the result. Now this value is a new data structure. It's not equal to program PRG. It cannot be equal because it contains that thing inside a case class. It cannot be itself equal to PRG. So it means that this monad law fails and we find that other laws also fail because uh, those laws usually say that something is equal to something but all our operations, if you look at the um, implementation of flat map and map, all they do is put more case classes on top of things. They don't actually simplify anything ever. So for this reason, um, it cannot simplify this to PRG. 
uh, it will create a new bind and all the other monad operations will create new case classes and never reduce anything. So basically the laws fail if you de demand that they hold literally like this. So our data structure DSL is not a lawful monad. It, it does not satisfy the laws. But once you interpret this data structure into a target monad, and assuming that this monad satisfies the laws, then the resulting values will satisfy the laws. And that's a very interesting property. Let's see how that works. So let's run this value. So how would you run this value? If you apply run to this, and by definition of the code, it needs to first run this and then apply flat map with this function and then run the results of this function. So that is the code. And if we now symbolically evaluate this code, we'll find that um, the runner of the literal, it will just give you a right of A, let's say in the uh, either monad, it will be really pure of A in general, but I'm just substituting the code from the previous slide. And because this is a pure for the uh, uh, either monad, the either monad has the law satisfied, and so flat map of pure is identity. And so the result will be equal to running the program PRG. So in this way, uh, assuming that the laws will hold for the monad M, this both sides, when we run them, will, uh, will be the same. So all other laws also hold. I will show that uh, next. But think about what it means. It means that the violations of the monad laws that this data structure has are not observable once you run uh, the computation. So the data structure uh, may have some extra information inside that gets computed away, it gets reduced or simplified uh, when you run or when you evaluate this into or interpret this into some target monad. So in this sense, I would say that the monad law violations are not observable. When you actually observe or run or interpret this program, there are no violations. So these violations are hidden somewhere in this data structure and they don't change the results. They don't make the results invalid. And so it's okay to have those violations. So let me show you now in the code why uh, the monad laws hold after evaluating into lawful monad. So we will reason uh, by taking an arbitrary DSL program and just denote by M the result of running this program for brevity. And um, let's see what happens when we run monadic operations on this program. So for example, uh, let's say that program is a pure of something. When we run that, then we execute the code of the runner, and that code is a pure. In the case of the either monad, this was the right of x, but in the case of a general monad, that will be pure of x. So, therefore, running the pure of the DSL gives you the pure of the target monad. Let's now run the map of the DSL. We get some other DSL program with some arbitrary function f. And by definition, it's going to be translated into this. When we run this, we have to translate that into flat map because that's how bind is translated. And we get 
this combination. Now we know that uh, when we do run dot flat map, this is the flat map in the monad M. Now, if we look at this, this is a run of the pure. So that is already, as we know, M dot pure. So now we have a flat map in the monad M of F followed by pure. So that is the definition in the monad M of map. So now this is equal to map in the monad M. In other words, running the results of map in the DSL gives you the result of map in the target monad. And the same happens with flat map. If you run the result of flat mapping in the DSL, which is another DSL program, and f is a function from some type A to a different DSL program, now we still need to interpret the result of this f in the monad m. So this will give us a function g of this type. Instead of a going to DSL of b, it's going to be a going to m of b. And this function is like this. It's f and then run. So now if we interpret the bind, it is going to be the flat map in the monad m of f and then run. And uh, if you just look at what that is, that's the function g that we defined, which is the evaluating of the result of the function f. So in this sense, evaluating flat map first in the DSL and then running the results is the same as evaluating in the monad M with the function G, which is obtained from F by running its results. So in this sense, all the monad operations in the DSL are directly translated by the interpreter into the corresponding monad operations in the target monad M. Now, if we consider the laws, uh, it's very easy to see that they hold after interpreting. Now, we already saw that in the slides for this right identity law. Let's look at the left identity law. Um, this needs to be verified. If we apply run to both sides, then we have to show that run of this is equal to run of that. So let's evaluate the run. If we do the pure flat map, then this is translated into that. If we run that, we get run of literal, which is just m of pure. So you have a pure followed by flat map of this. But pure followed by flat map is going to be in the monad m, and that is equivalent to just this function, which is g. Uh, so that's why. Uh, the run of the two sides is the same because the run of this is g of x. The naturality law for pure is like this. So the DSL pure of x of f of x is DSL f map of f of DSL pure of x. So now if we evaluate run on both sides, then this becomes m pure. This becomes mf map, this becomes m pure. So then obviously this holds because m has this law too. And uh, finally, associativity for flat map, it is this law. So that, let's apply both sides to some program PRG and then apply run to both sides. So we have the run of this should be equal to the run of that. So if we now simplify this into the monad m operations, then we get this. Now this flat map g is still a bit complicated because 
g is not yet run in the monad m into the monad m. So let's uh, use the law and um, uh, let's rewrite somehow this expression so that we get associativity law for the monad m. Now the left hand side is this and it should be equal to run of this which is flat map of f and then run flat map of g and then run. Now notice these flat maps are in the m monad this flat map is in the m monad but the argument of that flat map is complicated. So we do have the same law for the monad m, but we just need to rewrite this a little bit. So does it, this is going to be m flat map something flat map something needs to be simplified into m flat map this and then that. So how do we figure that out? We rewrite this complicated expression as an explicit function from a to, to what? Well, first we apply f to a, so it's f of a, then we apply flat map of g, which is this, and then we apply run, so it's run of all this. So let's simplify now. So run of f of a, now if you run a flat map, that's the same as running this, flat mapping of running that. So what's this? And equivalently we can say this is just f and then run applied to a and then this is flat map g and then run. So if we get rid of this a now then we get just a function f and then run and then m's flat map of g and then run. So that's exactly what we have in the associativity law for m. It's uh, m flat map of this is equal to that. So now fm and gm are just these. f and then run is fm, g and then run is gm. So we get the associativity law. The naturality laws for flat map um, could be verified as well. We don't need to do that since our code is purely type parametric and uh, naturality is automatic for that code. So I mentioned that this construction is called a free monad and in the cats library is called free. Uh, why this word free? What does it mean free? Why do we call this a free construction? Well, this terminology comes from mathematics. In mathematics, uh, usually free construction is a group or a, a monoid or a vector space or some other kind of algebraic construction that is generated by certain data with no constraints. So free means no constraints. Uh, so let me illustrate, uh, this is a bit vague, so let me illustrate in two, by two examples. Um, consider two things and I will choose things that mean very little by themselves. The Russian letter Tse and the Chinese word Shui. Uh, the letter Tse doesn't really mean anything by itself, it's just the letter of the uh, Kyrillic alphabet. And the Chinese word Shui, it means water, but it doesn't matter for now. So now suppose I wanted to multiply them. I wanted to multiply Tse by Shui. So what does it mean uh, to multiply? How would I multiply them? So mathematicians first ask what kind of product do you want? Do you want associative, commutative, distributive product? So let's say we want an associative product, not necessarily commutative. So mathematicians would then say very, very well, what you want is to define some kind of semigroup 
uh, in other words, a structure that has an associative but not necessarily commutative product. And you want a semigroup that contains Tse and Shui as elements. Uh, that's what you want. You don't, and and you would say, well, but I have no idea what these are. What Tse and Shui is, I have no idea. No, no worries. I'll get you a semigroup that contains them. And if you have a semigroup that contains them, a semigroup is a set, and these will be elements of that set. And if you have a semigroup that contains them, then you can take a product of them. So here's how the mathematicians would, would do it. They would consider the set of all unevaluated expressions of this kind. Any unevaluated expression with the multiplication sign or a product symbol dot, which I have here, and uh, one of these um, symbols, tse, tse, or uh, shui. So uh, this would be an unevaluated expression. This would be another unevaluated expression, but we will have the law that uh, this product is associative. So, you see, this expression isn't equal to another letter of the Russian alphabet or another Chinese word. It's not equal to any of those things. It's just an expression that's not evaluated. It's a new thing. So we have a set of a lot of new things, and Tse and Shui is, are, are one of those things, but there are a lot more of those things in the set because we are considering the set of all unevaluated expressions of this kind. So the set of all these expressions is called a free semigroup generated by uh, the elements Tse and Shui. And in some sense, it's the most unrestricted semigroup that contains these two things. Uh, you could have a lot of semigroups that contain these two things as elements, but this one is the least restricted. It's the most free of all arbitrary restrictions, as long as, of course, you have associativity of multiplication. So you can calculate in this semigroup. For example, this is a calculation that I can do. I take these two expressions, I take uh, their product, and then I multiply by this expression, and I get this expression as a result. These are calculations that I would do in this uh, free semigroup. And uh, what would I do with that? Well, I could interpret this semigroup value into another semigroup, for example. Integers. Imagine integers as a semigroup with multiplication as a semigroup operation. I say that Tse is 70 and Shui is, is 3. So then these are just going to be se uh, 3, 3, 70, 3, 70. I'll take a product of all of those and I have a number. So I have evaluated this. So in other words, this is going to be some kind of symbolic program that will later be evaluated in some way. And that's uh, very similar to what we have been doing with our DSL. It was a symbolic program that was interpreted at the end into specific values. But we can do calculations like this before evaluation. And this is a, uh, similar to combining parts of a DSL into a larger DSL program. And while we're doing this, we still uh, have the illusion that we are performing these operations. So how do we represent this as a data type? Well, the easiest thing, and what we have been doing so far, is what I call the tree encoding. In other words, we represent the free semigroup as a full expression tree. So here's an example. Um, each operation of product is just a pair, 
in the data structure. So I have a tuple of this and this, and uh, I'm missing one parenthesis on the left. Uh, I will insert that in the slides after the recording. Um, yeah, so I have a tuple, and this tuple represents the free product of the two shui. Then I have this tuple, which is a free product. Then I have a free product of these two, and finally a free product of the result and the tse. And so that in this way, I represent my expressions. That's very easy, and operations are very easy to implement because uh, to, to do, for example, the multiplication, I just put the two parts in a tuple, and I'm done. So this is uh, exactly equivalent to adding one more case class on top and um, having a nested structure. And uh, in this way, I implement all my required operations. But there is a, another encoding, which I call reduced encoding. And this encoding is smarter. It is less redundant. Um, and in this case, it's going to be a list of all these things taken in this order. This list is equivalent to what you would write on paper, because the associativity law means that it doesn't matter where the parentheses are. You can omit all parentheses, and you will still get the correct result. And so, since we know about that, we are clever and smart, and we realize that a list of these things in this order is sufficient. It is sufficient information to represent a value in the free semigroup. Now, if we want to implement the multiplication operation, you cannot just put the two lists in a tuple. You need to actually concatenate the two lists, and that could be more expensive, Depending on your implementation of lists, it could be a very quick big O of one operation, or it could be a more expensive operation. But this structure has no redundancy, whereas this structure has redundancy. Um, you could put parentheses in different order, and this will be a different expression tree, although uh, the final value is supposedly the same. Let's consider another example, which is a product of uh, n-dimensional vectors. So what if I wanted to define a product of two n-dimensional vectors? Or we have such a product for three-dimensional vectors. This is the well-known vector product in uh, the usual Euclidean three-dimensional space. But let's ignore that. And in any case, I want product for n-dimensional vectors with any n, and that doesn't seem to be generalizable from three-dimensional vectors. So how do I do that? Well, a mathematician again will ask me, what kind of product do I want? I say, well, it's a product of vectors, so I expect it to be linear, distributive, not necessarily commutative, but I want a product that has these properties, for example. I want to be able to add, so linear means I, I'm, I'm supposed to be able to add different products together, and that should be associative, and I'm supposed to do this. So if I have a linear combination of vectors under a product, and I'm, then I should be able to pull this thing out and expand the parentheses, and that's a distributive law, and the distributive law should hold for left and for right as well. All right, says the mathematician, you need a free vector space generated by all kinds of pairs of vectors from your n-dimensional space. So let's do it in this way. We consider all unevaluated expressions of this form where u and v are arbitrary vectors from your n-dimensional space. So this is a uh, the first step. The second step is to impose the equivalence relationships. So before this you get just a free vector space. You have all, all possible linear combinations of all possible products. 
That's uh, the first step. The second step is to impose equivalence relations. So um, you will consider certain pairs of expressions to be equivalent according to these laws. The result is usually called the tensor product of vectors. And again, we can have two encodings for the tensor product. The first encoding is the full unevaluated expression tree. And that would be just a list of these vector pairs. And that could be a very inefficient representation if you have a lot of those pairs. But it could also be a very efficient representation if you have a very sparse tensor product. The reduced encoding, that is the encoding that has no redundancy, is to represent the tensor product as an n by n matrix of uh, vector coordinates in some basis. Now, reducing this expression to the matrix form requires computation, and it could be uh, well, first you need to prove that your encoding is adequate, that, uh, for example, this expression and this expression always corresponds to the same encoding, uh, and then your laws would be satisfied, your equivalences would be satisfied, and you need to implement operations. So you need to translate this into matrix and add matrices and so on. But you can do that. So that's the choice. So uh, this is why uh, we use the word free construction. So basically we can um, use the, mathematic the, the mathematics uh, intuition to um, implement data structures with properties generated by things that don't have these properties. You see the, the common topic here is that I wanted to define an operation for things that don't have this operation. Like I wanted to multiply a Chinese and Russian uh, together. It's a word and a letter. It's, it's not defined, but I want to define it in some way, and I can in a free way. So um, uh, in the programming language, uh, we just saw an example where I was able to define a monad out of a type constructor that isn't even a functor. Uh, let's look at some other examples. And here would be an example of a semigroup that's generated by two types. So that's kind of similar to my Chinese and Russian example. So how do we define that? So let's uh, see how that works. So let's call it FSIS, which is free semigroup from integer and string. So a value of FSIS could be an integer, or it could be a string also. Or if x and y are already of type FSIS, then so is this combination of x, y, which I would call com uh, as a case class. So I straightforwardly translate this specification into the data type. And this will be the tree encoding. It's a full expression tree, un unevaluated. Um, and uh, that's, that's OK. It's a good encoding for some usages. The short type notation for this is going to be this. It's a recursive type that is defined by this type equation. Um, so uh, let's think about how we can use it. Now, if we have an actual semigroup S, a specific semigroup, and we know how to map integers and strings into that semigroup, then we can map this FSIS into a semigroup. That's our interpretation. So uh, let's see how that works. It's a little... Um, too specific with integers and strings. Let's just put all of these uh, domain types into a type Z and make that type a parameter. Um, so then the tree encoding would look like this. It's a recursive type that's defined like this. So 
I omit the Scala definition. Let me just write the definitions of the methods. So the method of semigroup operation is very easy. I just put the two arguments into a case class. And the run method takes a semigroup and an extractor function, which maps my z into a semigroup. And that's equivalent to the two functions that I assumed here before, just a single function from z to s. So then I get a function from my free semigroup generated by z to s. How would that work? I match on the free semigroup. It has two cases. Uh, the case of uh, f, well, I, I call it wrap here. Let's call it f. Um, then I just, oops, then I just extract. Uh, so I have a value of z and I call this function extract and to extract the value of semigroup s from it. And if I have the combination, then I first run these two. And then I get two values of type s and I just combine them in the semigroup operation of s. Quite similarly, the semigroup laws will hold after I apply this run. They do not hold before applying run. Why is that? It's, well, it's very easy to see. The associativity does not hold because I would have a comb nested in different order and that's not equal. So it's only after applying the, the interpreter that uh, laws will start holding. And the reduced encoding is a non-empty list of z's. So that's uh, a reduced encoding. Actually, I should have said here it's non-empty list. Um, I didn't make that, that uh, remark. Uh, empty lists cannot be constructed because you have to start with either Tse or Shui and apply the semigroup operation. There is no empty value possible. So that's why it's a non-empty list. And then uh, the, com the combination operation will require, uh, when you run this, it will have to concatenate the lists, but maybe the run operation will become faster because then you have fewer structures to traverse. As another example, let's impl implement the free monoid. The free monoid generated by type Z is very similar to a free semigroup. Um, the value of free monoid of z can be empty because it's a monoid or it can be a z and then you have a multiplication so uh, I should have called it com but not mol uh, so therefore the free monoid of z in the tree encoding has these uh, case classes the empty, the wrap, which has a z inside, and the, com and the com uh, combination, which has two values of fm of z inside. And the short type notation for this is just like that. Um, so here's an implementation of the runner. The plus operation simply puts the case class on top. And the runner just does the same thing as before, and it puts the m's empty, and m being a monoid, it has an empty element instead of this. So when we interpret this tree structure, we just substitute specific operations of the monoid m, except for the wrap case when we use the extractor. And monoid laws will hold after we apply this function. So this was the tree encoding, and the reduced encoding is just a simple list where this operation is concatenating the lists. The empty is the empty list, and the wrap is a list of one element.
And so it's interesting actually to notice that after running the tree encoding and the reduced encoding would give you the same result. They're just different encodings of the same value. Uh, they're not equivalent in terms of their performance, perhaps, and memory requirements are different, but they're equivalent in terms of the resulting value. Let's look at the code. So here is an implementation of the free monoid generated by type Z. So Z is some domain-specific type, and we have this combination, uh, and we just implement what I said in the slides. And here's an example of using this definition. So uh, first I define a monoid of integers in the standard way. And then I want to do a free monoid over this. So this was my example in the slides. So I define z to be that. Then I define an extractor. Extractor is a function from z to integer. So how do I do that? Well, if I have an integer, I just leave it there. If I have a string, I have length of the string. It's just for this uh, illustration. So now I construct a free monoid value. So how do I do that? Well, um, I use the wrap constructor to do specific values of z, so either left of int or right of string. So I, I wrap them. And then I combine them with the plus operation. So this is a free monoid value, which I can then run with my extractor. And the result is 16, because it's 12 and then 3, the length of this, and then 0, because it's empty, and then 1. So all of this must be added. So that's why it's 16. So let me also verify that the monoid laws would hold after running. Um, so let's just maybe make extract into an implicit argument and not, not write it every time or something. Just I'll just run of x like this. The associativity law. So I run this and I should get the same result as when I'm running it with the other order of parentheses. When I run this, I run over this structure. Now you see this structure still has the information about the order of parentheses, but when I run it, each comb is translated into the monoid operation plus in the target monoid m. And so when I run it the second time, I, I get uh, this result, which is in the target monoid m, and it has now no more information about the order of parentheses. And so when I run the other order of parentheses, I get the same result. Let's check the identity law. Um, this must be equal to the result of running x. Now, this is not actually equal to x because it's this combination case class. So as usual, the laws do not hold before you run because you are piling up case classes. But when you run that, you run of empty, that becomes m empty, then you run of x, and that's a monoid law in the monoid m, that this should be equal to run of x. And so running of empty plus x gives you the same result as running x, and the same will be for the other order. Now in the reduced encoding, it's obvious that all of this works because it's just a list, and we know that list is a monoid. So there's not much to implement, and the runner, however, needs to go over the entire list. So the runner, I'm implementing it using a fold over a list, and I'm folding with the monoid operation in the target monoid M. And I'm running exactly the same code as before with pretty much the same code, except here I'm using a helper function to wrap my values.
I get again exactly the same result. Um, so, what if we interpret this free semigroup that we had before into another free semigroup? Well, that would be an interesting thing to do. Uh, in general, we can interpret if we have, so for example, free semigroup generated by y into a free semigroup generated by z. We can interpret if we have an embedding from y into the free semigroup of z. That is certainly what we can do. But we know it's a free semigroup, so what if we just have an embedding from y to z? not from y to the free semigroup of z. Because a free semigroup is a big thing. And um, it's not maybe it's much easier to do this. And indeed that's uh, very easy because we just need to map this into that and it's straightforward because this is a functor. So this type constructor is a functor. As you see it has the type parameter always in a uh, covariant position, a positive position. Um, so this is a standard code that you would write with your eyes closed to implement the map for this functor. So now uh, we can use that and have a chain like this. We first map, map, and then run. Let's think about how we can simplify this. Well, first of all, this is a functor, so functor laws hold for it. So f map is composable. We can compose these two functions from x to y and from y to z into a single function from x to z and just f map once instead of f mapping twice. What's interesting is that the interpreter also composes with f map in a, in a way. And this is done by this uh, diagram. So if you first, so I'm, I'm killing the z here. So I have just fsx, fsy, and s. If we first f map x to y and then run through some function g that is the extractor from y to s, we should get the same result as when we are running with the composition of these two functions. Indeed, that is a law that the interpreter satisfies. And um, we can combine the uh, semigroups in this way, and we can also combine them in, in uh, disjunctive way. Why is that? Well, consider this semigroup. We have, obviously, an injection from x to the disjunction x plus y, so then we can f-map it, and we automatically get this injection, which means that a free semigroup generated by a, a disjunction of some types contains a free semigroup generated by one of these types. So in this way, we can combine semigroups very easily if we know the types of the free semigroups, we combine free semigroups if we know the types um, from which they were generated. So uh, next we will consider uh, what we can do further to simplify mapping free semigroups to different targets.